in Yemen. So the story is what we recited in the in, in Maghrib tonight, uh, in the story of Asama Idat al Buruj. واليوم الموعود وشاهد ومشهود قتل أصحاب الأخدود النار ذات الوقود إذ هم عليها قعود وهم على ما يفعلون بالمؤمنين شهود. Um, so there was there was a king in Yemen, and the king had his own particular faith. Some say it was Judaism, but irrespective, he believed in whatever he believed. Um, Around that time, there was a pious man, a very righteous man. You know, if you like, in, mod in, in our language today, one of the friends of Allah, Rabbul Izzah, of Christian faith, because that was the religion before us. Uh, and he was someone that Allah used to accept his dua. But he used to be a builder. He was a bricklayer. So he used to make mud bricks and lay it. Um, and he used to spend his, the nights in worship and especially the Sunday in worship, the, the, you know, the day off. And if he saw someone in need, he would help. But if you called him, listen, there's a sick person, come see him, he wouldn't go. Why? Because he didn't want to be, you know, noted. And as soon as someone discovered that, you know, his dua gets accepted, this, that and that, he used to leave that village and go to another one. He didn't want to attract people's attention. He wanted to have a secret relationship between him and the Lord. Um, and he was fine. So when he got discovered in one city and the other city, eventually he decided, Khalas, I'm going to leave this place. Traveled and towards Yemen. And there he jumped, he got into a caravan. They tied him up. They sold him as a slave to, uh, in, in Yemen. So there he used to. Uh, you know, do his bricklaying and this and that. And in Yemen, uh, the king was there. This king, you know, with, with the faith, whether it's Judaism or, or whatever, uh, that was his faith. And part of this system of this government was that there was magicians. And uh, the magician used to make sure that the reign, the, the, the rule of the king survives. You know how uh, people are affected by these things. So uh, the, the, the king wanted, you know, to have his awe established over the, over the khalq. So the magician used to do bits and pieces for him, bring information, do little wonders. And people used to think the king is, the king is wow. So the people were nice and humble and obedient to the king. Now this, this magician was reaching old age and dying. Uh, so he came to the king, and this narration is in, 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 in Sunan Imam Ahmad, um, in the tafs and it is mentioned in the tafsir of, of Surah Al-Buruj. So Imam Ahmad, uh, no, uh, so uh, this magician came to the king and said, listen, O king, uh, I have reached old age, I will die. Uh, find a young lad who is intelligent, who can learn from me, so, you know, so that your reign can continue. So the king found a young man, intelligent. His name is Abdullah. This is not any Adab. This is a new Abdullah. So Abdullah was on his way to the magician. This pious man's tent was between the house of Abdullah and the house of the magician or the place of the magician. So as he's walking past the tent, he, you know, curiosity got the better of him. He had a look. He got attracted to what the, you know, righteous monk is doing and stayed with him, kind of got affected by him, and then he goes, oh no, late, got to go to the magician. Went there, uh, the magician scolded him, why are you late? Uh, so, you know, in the olden days, teachers used to whack you uh, as well, so he probably got, got a few sticks, and then uh, came back home, the mom and dad said, why are you late? So they probably gave him some as well. So the, the poor kid, you know, got, uh, got a double dose that day. So next day he came to the rahib and he go to, to this uh, priest and he goes, listen, bad day yesterday, that one hit me and that one hit me. Uh, so so the, po the, the, the monk tells him, he goes, listen, tell the magician your parents delayed you, tell your parents the magician delayed you. Whatever time you get from there, just spend with me and learn. So he would do that, the young boy would do that. And subhanAllah, it's an amazing situation. Because inside the mind of this man, of this young lad, two arts or two, uh, you know, op opposing so uh, powers of fighting. So one is the power of truth and one is the demon. One is, 
uh, you know, the path to Allah Rabbul Izzah, and the other one is the magic of the shaitan. So what, you know, in both, he, he's studying both. Um, so, and slowly, uh, one, one day as his knowledge and taqwa and iman grows, uh, a beast uh, is running loose in the city. Uh, but the, the verse of the, you know, the, the wording of the hadith, and people, people are all perturbed, because, you know, when a beast runs wild, whether it's an elephant or whatever, it, it's, it's a mess. Um, so this young man picked up a rock, and he, he did, a, he did a, a little intention. He goes, Ya Rab, uh, if the rahib is right, if, if this priest is right and the magician is wrong, I'm going to chuck this rock, kill this thing with it, the beast. So he threw the rock, and this big beast died because of a, a little rock. You know, beasts don't die because of rocks, but he, he died. So khalas, it was confirmation to him that, that the priest is right, that this monk is right, and uh, magic is wrong. So he came back to his teacher, to the monk, and he said, this is what I did. So the monk goes, oh. You know, he realized that he's reached a place in Iman where now it's inevitable Allah will test him. You know, difficulties will come. So he said, listen, son, you have reached a place where tests will be unleashed now. But when it comes, don't mention my name. Like, you know, when the trouble starts, don't mention my name. So this young man, uh, Allah Rabbul Izza gave him uh, the purity way. And people who were affected with sicknesses and this would, you know, if he saw them, he'd make dua and Allah would cure the person. So slowly, and he would tell them, listen, Shifa is not from me, Shifa is from Allah. I'm asking Allah, believe in Allah, Allah can cure you. So the person would believe, this man would make dua. And pretty soon they say a lot of the people who were sick otherwise in the city became cured and became believers. And word starts to spread across the city, so everyone starts to hear, you know, this young man, uh, his dua is accepted and he does this and does that. And one of the, one of the narrations with regards to this is the king had a, had a wazir, wazir had gone blind. So the wazir, you know, can you, he's sitting in front of the king blind, so the king obviously notices the man's blind. Uh, so... Uh, and then the wazir is obviously looking for some way to get cured, and eventually he hears of this young lad. The young goes to him, finds him, uh, says, son, listen, can you do something to my eye? He goes, I can't do anything. Allah does. If you believe in him, I can make dua for him to cure you. It's up to him to cure. So he goes, listen, I, I'm, I'm happy. So the young boy made dua. Allah returned his eyesight. So next day he comes to the king, and his eyes are open. It's, it's all working. So the king goes, you know, uh, what happened? He goes, oh, uh, my Lord cured me. So the king goes, me? Because, you know, I am Lord. I am a rabbi. He goes, me. He goes, no, my Lord and your Lord. Like, Allah. So upon this, uh, you know, investigation, he found that this man has found another faith, and it's not upon my religion. So he punished the wazir until he gave him the name of the lad, brought the boy, punished the boy until he gave the name of the priest so he brought the priest listen retract your faith and everything is fine and how can you retract faith you know for you've drank water from a clean source how can you accept sewage after that this is this is it so they say the hadith says they put a saw you know those big saws i imagine the ones that you cut the tree trunks with in the olden days you know one man pulls one man pulls that one uh, on his head and they cut the the priest down the middle uh, and then he cut the wazir. And then the, the name of the boy has gone like wildfire across the city. Everyone knows that this is what... So he, he couldn't do a little kill for him, you know, a silent kill. So he goes, listen, take him to the mountain and drop him from the mountain. Nice dramatic end, you know, so everyone gets the message, the king is king. So they took the boy up towards the mountain. And as they're climbing up, the young boy makes dua, Ya Rab, suffice me their evil any way you decide. Whatever way you want to deal with them, deal with them, Ya Rab. So Allah Rabbul Izzah shook the mountain, they fell off, all of them dead. The young boy came, the young man came back to the king, and his, his courage is admirable. He doesn't go home and hide, he comes back to the king, like, hello, I am back. So the king goes, What happened? He goes, They all they all died. Allah, my Lord killed them. So king is more upset, what to do? All right, got another, uh, you know, 20 or so people, take him in the ocean, chuck him into the sea, let him drown. Went into the boat, 
So he goes, Ya Rab, deal with them in any way you choose. Allah shook the boat. They all fell down. The man came back to the king, you know, high. Uh, so uh, he told the king, he goes, listen, there's only one way you can kill me. And the man is intelligent, the young boy. He's a da'i, you see. His, his aim is to promote the deen. So he goes, how? He goes, gather all the people. Then tie me on a tree or on a pillar. And get an arrow from my quiver, put it in the bow, pull it. And say nice, loud and strong, say, I shoot this arrow and kill this boy in the name of the Lord of the boy. In the name of the Rabb of the boy. So the king in his anger got all the people, got the man, pulled the arrow out, says, I shoot in the name of the Lord of the boy, shot. And they have all heard, everyone's heard, you know, one batch of people went and died, the king can't kill him, went, another one batch, they all died. All their families are probably mourning, you know, of all those 20, 40 soldiers that died, everyone knows. Uh, so this boy, uh, the man shot, and um, it hit him, and the young man died. But everyone became believers. You know, because the, 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 the man has confessed there's another, there's a, there's, a, there's a true God. So the king got angry, ordered his soldiers to dig trenches, like dig pits, put fire in the pits, burnt it till it's very hot, uh, brought the civilians who had believed on the edge of the pit. Do you believe and, you know, disbelieve in what you believe in? They said, no, push him in push him in. And the, the last they say was a young, uh, a, a young mom with, with a little infant. And uh, she looked at, at the child feeling emotional, you know, that they, because of him maybe to save him. So they say he looked at her and said, you're on the truth, stay firm. So she jumped with the child uh, into the fire. So these were Christians, you see. They, all, they, they were all killed like that. But two ran away, and they went and eventually reached Ethiopia, where the big uh, Christian emperor and Najashi is, the Nagas. The Nagas is the title of the rulers of Ethiopia, and Najashi. And he's a devout Christian, even the time of the prophet, the other Najashi, that, you know, that they went to him and he embraced them, you know, devout, pious person. So, uh, this An-Najashi heard that his brethren of faith, the Christians, were slaughtered by this king. Uh, he got angry, organized a, you know, army, 70,000, went there, and he said, trample on the soils of Yemen, kill the king, take a third of them hostage, and, and, and so on. And so, he sent two generals. One is Ariat, and the other one is Abraha. They went together, annihilated everyone, destroyed the city, um, sent slaves back to the king, uh, and so on. And the Abyssinians took over Yemen. And uh, the two generals, you know, two people in similar positions, they, they, ambitions take over. One tries to take the, 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 the seat from the other and, and so on. So they were annoying one another, not listening to commands, this and that. Eventually, half of the army supported Abraha, half supported the other one, and they were going to have an, a fight. So Abraha listen, says, listen, instead of killing soldiers, me and you will have a duel. Me and you go. We'll have a fight. Whoever wins becomes the general of the entire army. So in the olden days, how dueling worked. So what you do is you come to fight, and you bring what you call uh, a second with you. So you know, say you know, if this person is coming to fight, it will be him and his best friend, or someone who will be you know his second. And the other side will bring two, you know, himself and someone else with him as well. And they will fight, and whoever wins or whoever dies. So they say Abraha was not physically wow, uh, and the other man was solid, big, you know, general, general. Um, so the fight started, and the Ariat smashed him with, with his blade or with his spear, and he tried to defend it, but it cut through, and it got Abraha like this. Like it cut his eyebrow, cut 
the edge of his eye, slit his nose, and down his mouth. Um, so because of that, uh, they used to call him the one with the split face. Like Abraha al-Ashram, the one with the cut face. But as he got hit, and he's down in the blade of this generalist on, on Abraha, he second jumped and stabbed the general. And then together him and Abraha went and hit the other. So, so Abraha became the general of the entire army. The problem is this quarrel was okay between generals, but the generals belong to someone else. They're the generals of an Najashi, the emperor. You can't kill a general and the emperor let it go. So when Najashi heard that his general's been killed, he swore an oath that I will come and trample on your land and cut your forelocks. Like, as in, you know, the, the, the French, the, the front of your forelocks. I'll, I'll cut your hair, like as in embarrass you, and I will trample. So uh, Abraha heard. So Abraha, before the king could come, cut his own hair, put it in a bag, and took some soil, put it in a bag, sent it to an Najashi. He goes, oh king, I heard your oath. Here's the hair that you wanted, and here's the soil. Trample on that soil, take this hair in your hand, your oath is completed. He was your servant, I am your servant, we are still in obedience. We just had a quarrel in which he unfortunately died. And then to kind of win favor with the king, he said, but now I will build you a cathedral, the like of which has not been built for any before you. So I will build you a, 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 a church. So he set out and he built a monumental thing. You know, in those days, they say the pillars uh, were so tall, the towers, that if you looked up, your hat would fall. And, uh, you know, uh, the crosses had gold and silver on it, and the pulpit had ivory in it. It was a work of art. And then he said, I will tell the Arabs to forget about the Kaaba and worship here. So when he said this, uh, Historically, Arabs don't take insults very well. You know, so when the Arabs heard that he has said this, that he will come and take, you know, change our, our direction from the Kaaba to his cathedral, uh, one of them took the long journey, uh, went to his cathedral, and defiled it. You know, because there are kids here, so I don't... Anyway, he, the man defecated in the corner uh, of, of the church. He, he did a boo-boo on the, on the corner of the church. And uh, this, so Abraha got very upset when he found that it is someone related to the Quraysh. And he took an oath that I will erase their temple in the disrespect that they have shown. There's another narration that another uh, group of young lads came and they, uh, I don't know, they tried to start a fire and pretty soon they burnt the whole cathedral down. So which, whichever one or both. So now Abraha got an army organized to come and erase the Kaaba. So this is the third big thing in the life of Abdul Muttalib. The army of the elephants. So Abraha took a huge army, some say 70,000, and an Najashi sent a specifically, you know, a special elephant just for this purpose. So they say there were some 13 elephants, other scholars say 11 elephants, at the head of which was this mammoth of a thing, and the name of this elephant, this one has a name, it's called Mahmoud. Huge thing, and I, I actually researched you know, how big these Ethiopian elephants grow. And I found a picture in which this mammoth of a thing is standing next to a four-wheel drive. And the four-wheel drive looked small. So if you can imagine an army coming with these big elephants, and the elephants were trained for war. Like, the, no, the, they are normal elephants, you know, who you go and sit on the back and it takes you around if you go to Thailand and places like that. They're nice and civil creatures, you know. War elephants are, are not nice creatures, you know, they're, so they're, they're trained for war. And can you imagine this big thing, and they usually have armor on them as well, so, so that spears and stuff cannot go in. Uh, it was a frightening sight. And normally, horses and camels are afraid of elephants, so they, they can't stand in their way too much. 
So this huge army, at the vanguard of which is these huge elephants, is making its way out of Yemen with the idea that I'm going to destroy the Kaaba. The Arabs decided, let's put up a resistance first in Yemen. When they stood up against them, he thrashed them, took their leader as captive, went into what is Saudi today, went into there. Uh, another tribe decided that they're going to show a written resistance, annihilated them, took Nufail, you know, the, the man's name, as, the, as, as another guide from here, spared his life for the condition that, listen, you will guide the way through. He accepted, came towards Taif. Taif had already heard what has happened. Taif had a big idol, like a, a temple themselves for one of their idols. They didn't want the man to make a mistake and destroy this one. So they came out and said, listen, O king, we are your servants. The one you're looking for is on the other side. Here, take this guide with you and he will show you. So this in, in Arab history is a very embarrassing thing that the people that, you know, that, that this tribe did. Uh, and the man went to kind of lead the way to the Kaaba so that, so that Abraha, the Abyssinian, could destroy it. But two miles out of Mecca, the man died. They buried him there in a place called al Mughamis. Um, and the people used to stone his grave out of, you know, the, the sense of shame and upset that, you know, you were trying to destroy the Kaaba. Um, so Abraha camped two miles out of Mecca. And he's a general. He knows how to, how to play the war game. Uh, he decided to send... Um, a battalion of, of horse riders into the city so they can loot and that way people get scared as well you know it's fast it's surgical it's uh, um, and he came and they collected booty they collected animals they collected weapons they collected wealth and brought it back to Abraha so part of what they collected was 200 camels of Abdul Muttalib now, at this stage, where is Abdullah? He's gone on the business trip. He's gone on, on the business trip. Amina is pregnant. Fifty days after this, she will give birth to someone very special. Fifty days after this incident. This is why this is Amul Fil. So, Abraha is in his camp. They've probably pitched a high-class tent for him. And, Ab and he sends a delegation inside the city, send me your chief. So they send him Abdul Muttalib. And they say he was a man of very imposing presence. You know, imagine him. He's 92 at least. Uh, so age, wisdom, very handsome, still able, uh, relatively tall, like taller than, than medium. Uh, you know, uh, the weather of the desert ev evident on his face, you know, so he's, he's coming. As he came into the room, Abraha looks at him. And, and can you imagine, this man shares a DNA with the Rasul. So, when Abraha sees him, uh, he actually gets up to greet him. And then he thinks, where should I sit the man? Because if I sit him next to me, uh, he will be my equal. And protocol-wise, that's not appropriate. So, and I can't make the, him stand, so he says, let's sit on the floor. So Abraha has sat in, Abdul Muttalib sat with him on the floor, like on the carpet, if you like. Uh, and he's heard about him. He is the one that is the, the custodian of the Zamzam, the one that's benevolence is known. He feeds the you know, wealthy and the non-wealthy, and, the, and, and he, that he's known. Uh, so a man with that reputation, he expected you know, that he will come and try to bargain with me with regards to the Kaaba. So Abdul Muttalib says, I have just come for my 200 camels. So it was an anti-climax for Abraha, like, you know, I gave you respect, I calmed down, I thought you were all that, and all you're interested in 200 camels. So he told him, he goes, you know, I was impressed by you, but you just want 200 camels. So Abdul Muttalib said what is recorded golden line in history, he said, I am the Lord, I am the owner of the camels, and the house has its own Lord. 
So he will defend the house, I will defend my property. So he returned the, the camels, and Abdul Muttalib has now seen the army. So he came back to his people, there's no way. Uh, vacate the city, go to the hills, because Makkah is surrounded by hills and mountains. Uh, so everyone has gone up to the mountains, to the hills, uh, but they can see, because you know, when you're up the hills, you can, you can see what's happening. And then this army marches, some 70,000 with the pomp and ceremony and 11 or 13 mammoth of elephants and this Mahmoud in front of a giant by any definition. And they come towards the haram and this Nufail man comes next to the ear of the camel. He had learned some of the commands walking with them. And he tells the camel one narration, kneel, sit. And another one, it says, kneel, you're approaching the house of your master. So it knelt. It sat. And can you imagine the annoyance of Abraha? Uh, like the whole army's got a show moment. Everyone's watching. This is the grand finale. He's going to destroy the Kaaba. Uh, and now the, the elephant's stuck. So get the elephant moving. So they come, get up, you know, pull nothing happens, they poke, nothing happens. They get hooks and they put it on the hind legs to, you know, you know if you poke someone, it, they, they have to get up, so. Uh, elephant won't move. So they pull him that way, he's happy to go that direction, gets up, goes, happy to go that direction, happy to go backwards, tell him to go front, he kneels again. So as they're getting frustrated and busy, getting upset and annoyed, trying to lift this thing up, all of a sudden they hear the screeches of birds. And they come from around, you know, the different horizons, if you like, mountains, hillsides, till it looks like the sky is covered in darkness. And they are special birds and they swoop down with three pellets, one in the beak, two in the hands, like one arm, one arm, or one leg, one leg. And they pelt it like that. You know, uh, they pelt it. And the scholars say uh, special stones, like uh, wherever it hit, it would go in a linear line across. So if it dropped at the head, it would come back out of the bottom. If it hit the hand, it would come out of the other side. And once it hit, very quickly, the meat would rot like it will start to decay and fall apart and fall apart. So can you imagine the sky is filled with these things and the screeching and the pelting and, and they, they can't do anything because what can you do with a bird? It's a little thing, you can't shoot it with an arrow, you know, because birds are just flying about. So the army is in disarray, the elephants are screaming, you know, it's going and Abraha got back on his horse and uh, they took him up but he got hit. And as he's traveling, the body deteriorates, deteriorates. And by the time he reached the stop near Yemen, his body had fallen so much apart that they say his heart could have just fallen out. Um, and all of Makkah watched. They, they saw. They saw. And Allah Rabbul Izzah reminds them in the timeless verses, Qala Ta'ala, huh? أَلَمْ تَرَ كَيْفَ فَعَلَ رَبُّكَ بِأَصْحَابِ الْفِيلِ Didn't you see what your Lord did to the companion of the elephant? أَلَمْ يَجْعَلْ كَيْدَهُمْ فِي تَضْلِيلِ Didn't he make their plans into a disgrace? وَأَرْسَلَ عَلَيْهِمْ طَيْرًا أَبَابِيلِ And sent upon them birds from every direction تَرْمِيهِمْ بِحِجَارَةٍ مِّنْ سِجِّيلِ pelting them with uh, baked stones of clay, uh, to my mind, probably, uh, you know, radioactive or some kind of chemical in it. Um, and he left them like chewed out fodder. You know, like you've ate grass left here and left, uh, scattered, dispersed, torn apart. And as this is happening here on this mountain, is Amina with her little infant who will be born 
50 days from now in an event which will eclipse the year of the elephant altogether. Because to us, bigger than any military campaign is the birth of the Rasul. Uh, I thank you, my dear brothers and sisters, for your patience. Um, so, insha'Allah ta'ala, we have covered the three main uh, aspects or, uh, you know, milestones in the life of uh, Abdul Muttalib. Um, Zamzam, the sacrifice of the hundred camels, uh, and now uh, the army of the elephants. And may Allah Rabbul Izzah bless you and guide you and guard you. فَقُلْتُ مَا قُلْتُ إِن تَكُوا حَسَنَةً فَمِنَ اللَّهُ وَإِن تَكُوا سَيِّئَةً فَمِنَ نَفْسِ وَشَيْطَانٍ وَالسَّلَامُ عَلَيْكُمْ وَرَحْمَةُ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى وَبَرَكَاتُهُ